Thank you, and thanks for coming out. I know, I know that uh, Professor Rosser was explaining to me that even though Thanksgiving isn't for a, a week, it's almost Thanksgiving in a way because the break starts Monday, which means people who are done with classes or almost done with classes are already peeling off to wherever it is they go. Um, I, I could pretend that you know, there's other things Bob didn't, well, Bob, there's lots of things Bob could have mentioned about me, uh, but he got all the relevant, uh, important stuff. The title of this talk is Income and Wealth Inequality, What's the Problem? That is provocative if you read it one way and completely boring if you read it another way, which is part of what I want to talk about is, well, what is the problem? Like, actually think about this, because I do think income and wealth inequality are problems, or I would put it this way, I tend to think of them as being symptoms of problems. But there is a whole other problem with income and wealth inequality, which is measuring them. It's very tricky, it's very difficult. So I wanna talk about some concepts, some terminology. One is, the difference between wealth inequality and income inequality, right? Income and wealth are not the same thing. Imagine a wealthy person who's living a life of leisure. As a matter of fact, uh, there, you know, many people who criticize inequality, part of their concern, as a matter of fact, if I think about inequality, if I were to think about bad effects of wealth inequality in particular, one concern I would have, I'll just give my own normative view on this. One concern I would have is idle rich. People who could be productive but aren't being productive, right? People who are just, just kind of doing very well without contributing much. And I don't know why I should care what other people do with their time and, and their efforts, but for some reason that does bother me. I'll admit it. Uh, then compare that with income inequality. Well, income inequality is people earning more in terms of income than other people do. So this is CEOs earning 30 million a year versus people who work for them earning $10 an hour, right? That's income inequality. And obviously there's a whole range of incomes that people can potentially earn. If you were to just look at university faculty, you would probably see a significant amount of income inequality. I'm gonna guess that uh, professors in the business school earn more than professors in some of the other colleges. That's, how, that's my experience at the, at the past two institutions I've been at. And so even inequality at a local level generates a lot of discussion, not just at a national or international level. And then a third key thing to think about is income mobility and whether people are actually able to move up or down in terms of their income and how well they're doing. Now, I put just lack of mobility because there's not just income mobility, there's also wealth mobility, which is not something I think people focus a whole lot on, but there's actually quite a bit of wealth mobility going on, and I'll talk about that in a little, uh, in a little bit. But when you ask the question, what's the problem with inequality, one kind of first cut is, well, what is it you're concerned about? Are you concerned about Wealth inequality in particular, income inequality in particular, income or wealth mobility in particular, all of them, two of the three, right? It's something we're thinking about. There are many ways to measure wealth inequality. I'm going, I have a chart for one. I'll talk about some other measures of wealth inequality. So this is a measure of US wealth inequality uh, done by, uh, published by Kapsuk and Saez. Emmanuel Saez was Thomas Piketty's co-author on all of the income inequality stuff they did. Uh, Kapsuk and Saez, for this measure, for this graph, and for the paper that this came from, used uh, estate tax returns to try and get a handle on the wealth of the top 
of wealth holders in the U.S. economy versus the bottom 99% versus everyone else. So this is not income, this is wealth, right? And they use the state tax returns to gather this data. And the trend is, this runs up to 2000, the paper is a few years old now. What they did was, or what they found was, there is a significant drop from the early 20th century to the end of the 20th century, but for a big chunk of the 20th century, right, relatively flat, mild decline, okay? Now, Emmanuel says, one of, one of these authors on this paper, where this data came from, he, uh, he has another more recent paper with uh, Gabriel Zuckman is, is his name. Uh, and they use a totally different measure. They use a totally different source of data. And that source of data is still from tax returns, but it's from income tax returns and it's on, uh, it's on capital income. And they show a U-shape trend in wealth inequality, where it declines in the early part of the 20th century, is kind of flat in the bottom, and then has an uptick l late in the 20th century, starting in the 80s. It actually looks very, very similar to income inequality trends when, you, uh, when we get to that. Uh, I could editorialize on this. My, my brief editorial comment on this is, for now, I don't think that paper is actually like published, published yet. Uh, for now, or for a long time, this was considered kind of the best source of wealth inequality data by economists who were studying wealth inequality. It matches what, uh, what an economist named Wolf uh, had. He had very similar levels and very similar findings using different data. Uh, but people can debate that. But this trend, what you see is the top 1% of wealth holders holding a little over 20% of the wealth in the US. Is that good or bad? Good question. I, that's something really worth thinking about. Uh, Piketty, in his book, Capital, was very focused on wealth inequality. Now, most of his research up until he wrote that book was actually on income inequality, not on wealth inequality. That's why I want to make this distinction so clear. Because there's almost a, it's a little bit of a, a new research direction for Thomas Piketty when he wrote his book and went and talked more about wealth inequality really than he did income inequality. Income inequality comes up in the book, but he's focused a lot on wealth. And he proposes that the reason for growing inequality is that R is greater than G, and R stands for the rate of return on capital, you know, like capital goods, the goods that make land and labor more productive, is greater than the overall growth rate. So what happens is the economy's growing and that benefits people and makes them better off, it makes the masses better off, but what's happening even faster is the elite owners of capital are seeing really high rates of return relative to the overall growth rate. Um, an example of this might be if you look at an S&P 500 index fund, uh, the S&P 500 index, if you were invested in that, that's been gaining somewhere between 11 and 12 percent over the past 30 years, 40 years versus the overall growth rate of the U.S. economy, real growth rate of around 3% over the same time period. So 11 half, almost 12%, minus 3%, we're seeing a much higher rate of return for people who are investors, right? There are all kinds of criticisms of this R is greater than G thing out there. Uh, I put one up here because I just thought it was very interesting. Larry Summers, it was, I couldn't tell from reading it. I read it probably three, four times. I couldn't exactly tell from reading it whether it was a positive or negative review. I thought it was very, it was actually a very warm review in that he was saying things like, Thomas Piketty is doing the kind of research that people get Nobel laureates, that people are Nobel laureates for, that people get Nobel prizes for, because it's so important and so fundamental a question, and he should be honored just for asking the question and gathering so much data and doing a lot of groundbreaking research. So he had a lot of praise for Piketty, but he had a peculiar, or a particular criticism of this R is greater than G thing, which I found interesting, which is he, thinks that when Piketty is saying the rate of return on capital is greater than the overall growth rate of the economy, that 
he is making kind of a very big mistake where he doesn't take depreciation into account, right? And the thing is, part of what Piketty is saying with this R is greater than G is he's saying that people have capital, they invest capital, they earn a high rate of return on it relative to the growth rate. And to keep earning that return over time, they're reinvesting essentially all of it. Well, do they? Do they re so one question is just do they reinvest all of that? But another important question is, isn't, it, isn't what really matters your return net of depreciation and there's depreciation on capital goods. Uh, another criticism that Summers mentions and other people mention is that when you think about people investing in capital and continually reinvesting what they've earned off of capital back into new capital is that there are diminishing returns to capital, right? that if there weren't a significant increase in the amount of labor and everything else you have going on, the other, uh, the other inputs right, that are complementary to capital, what's going on there? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't that capital start to see diminishing returns? That's actually even a separate question from what uh, Professor Summers was asking. I'm calling him Professor Summers, like that was like his first job. Uh, Professor Summers was asking in terms of depreciation, but it seems that it, it seems that there are problems just with that, that explanation of R is greater than G. The question of has income inequality increased, has wealth inequality increased, right? Has mobility increased or decreased? Those are all empirical questions. Piketty makes a very big contribution through lots of his work through the past 20 years or so towards answering the empirical question of what's happened and what's changed. But this explanation, uh, personally, I'm not sure holds water. Let's talk about income inequality. I'm going to start with some international comparisons. So what I'm using up here are Gini, or what I, I pulled this, <laughs> right? These are Gini coefficients. Uh, and. Um, These may have been smooth because there's not a big, oh, there is, there is. It's just the data are so long term that you can't see it. But there was a major change in how Gini, the Gini index was measured uh, in the mid 80s, or no, in the early 90s. And so that, there's gonna be uh, an inconsistency. You can't really compare the Gini index prior to like 1992 to the Gini index from 1993 on because they changed how they measured it. But what is a Gini index? What is a Gini coefficient? It's simply how far away from perfect equality an economy is. All right, so a Gini index of zero means perfect income equality. Everybody earns the same. A Gini index of one means perfect income inequality. It means one person earns 100% and everybody else earns zero, I guess. I'm trying to imagine everyone earning zero, right? <coughs> so it's measured as a percentage, zero to 100%, or between zero and one, depending on how you want to state it. And what you see is, of the countries listed, Brazil's really high, Mexico's really high, but then the United States, if you look at current Gini index, the United States is way up there. It is similar to China, it's not that far above India and the UK, but it's well above countries like Norway, Canada, Italy, Belgium, France, Poland, etc. Sweden, definitely above Sweden. And what's more is there's a trend in the US, which is from the middle of the 20th century on that Gini, uh, that Gini coefficient has risen. I'm going to talk briefly about another way. Well, okay, this just focuses on the US. It's just the Gini index over again so that you can see it more specifically for the US. And you see that bump in the early 90s, and that's what I'm talking about. That was when there was a change in how it was actually measured. I was at a lecture last week where someone actually explained the Gini coefficient, the Gini index, by going through the math of it and everything, and that was fine because it was faculty and master students in the room, but I thought, what does it really measure? It measures how far you are away from perfect equality, right? So the higher the number, the more unequal the, uh, the income distribution. Well, 
Piketty and Saez, that's what PS stands for, Piketty and Saez have really gotten interested in understanding income inequality and they argued that Gini coefficients are good in a sense that there, that's data we have on lots of different countries and we can make all kinds of international comparisons but it doesn't quite tell you some very important things that they think they see when you get down into the real nature of income inequality in the US. So the real nature of income inequality in the US, they argue, is what the really, really, really top earners have receive in terms of income. So who are the top, top income earners and how much of the overall share of income, right, how much of national income goes to just the top 1% and they actually have charts of top half a percent and top tenth of a percent and top one hundredth of a percent. For the top one percent, you see it's about 17, 18. This is one of their earlier runs where it runs through about 2008, I think. Uh, it's just under 18 percent. So we're talking about one percent of people earning 18% of the total income when you add up all the income in the economy. The trend. The trend is interesting because the trend looks like what Saez and Zuckman found for wealth inequality when they used capital income as a measure of wealth, as a way to measure wealth, versus when they used estate tax uh, data. But what is the trend? Well, they tell a narrative of what happened in the 20th century was in the US, income inequality was very, very high in the early part of the century. It fell dramatically after World War II. Never mind that a big part of that drop is actually right in the middle of World War II. But it fell dramatically after World War II. And then you had kind of this golden era of income equality in the US from roughly 1950 to 1980. So for roughly 30 years, you had relatively low levels of income inequality in the US. Income distribution was much, much more equal than it was both before that period and since 1980. They have an explanation for this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually put that off and get to that later. But we can imagine what maybe what was going on for part of that, right? If you well, think access to education, you had more other things that created more fair distribution of income. You know, they could talk about taxes, they could talk about benefits and all of that. Now, one thing that's important to realize though is that this is all pre-tax income. It's pre-tax data. It actually comes from tax returns. So it comes from the top line on people's tax returns. And the reason the data set starts in 1913 is because nobody in the US filed a tax return prior to 1913. So when I look at that chart, and I think a lot of people when they look at that chart would come up with at least one or two of these questions. But when I look at that chart, I have three questions that really pop out at me. One is, why is that trend U-shaped? Like what is the big, is there some big single factor driving the U-shape of that, of that trend? Why is it so high, so low and flat there in the middle of the 20th century and then rising so rapidly? And then why is it so volatile? Like here's what I mean. I, I see a lot of volatility there. I see I see lots of spikes and troughs, right? Like there are years where in one year there was a really big change in income distribution. Really big change in terms of how much of total income the top 1% earned. What could make a switch flip like that, right? In particular, well one year I know is uh, between like 1940 and 1943, we have a really big drop. And then the th third question I had, I focused really on 1987. What on earth happened in 1987? 
1986, next data point, 1987. So my answer is there may be lots of things driving the overall trend of rising inequality since 1980, if you just want to pick that as a time, right? And there may have been something driving the decline of inequality from 1913 to 1950. But there's only one thing that really tells us a lot about the overall U-shape, the volatility, and especially what happened in 87, and that's the tax code. So for 1987, I'll, give, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. What happened in 1986 that led to such a big change in income distribution in 1987? Well, what happened was there was a big, uh, big change in the tax code passed called TRA 86, the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And what the Tax Reform Act of 1986 did was, for the first time in U.S. tax history, made it so that the corporate income tax rate was higher than the highest marginal personal income tax rate. So all the way up until then, the corporate income tax had moved around, top marginal rates on personal income had moved around. Right? So in other words, people who make a lot of money, right, those last dollars they earned were taxed at a really high rate. Sometimes they're taxed at a slightly lower rate. But that has moved around and this has moved around. But up until 1986, in other words, up until 1987 really, what was going on was if you could declare something, if you earned a whole lot of money, if you could find a way to declare it as corporate income instead of personal income, you paid a much lower tax rate. The Tax Reform Act of 1987 flipped that relationship. It cut that top personal income tax rate enough that it was below the corporate income tax rate. And guess what happened? What happened is people started reporting a lot more personal income. That's where these data come from. They come from personal income tax returns that people file with the IRS. That top number you write, which is whatever your total income is. It's not even adjusted gross income, it's the, the total. There have been some criticisms of Piketty and Saez. Uh, one is that because they're using IRS data, it doesn't take into account the fact that people who earn a lot of money are often paying a lot in income taxes, and so their income after taxes is lower, right? And it doesn't count transfers, which means people who earn very low levels of income are often receiving a lot of transfers because they qualify for things like food stamps and other sorts of assistance. And so after transfers, or even people who are retired are getting transfers from Social Security, right? So there are lots of people who are earning less who are getting transfers, there are lots of people earning more who are paying taxes. Taxes, and that would reduce the inequality naturally on its own, the fact that we have some redistribution going on. Then another criticism is it measures taxable units, not households. This is a really interesting criticism because they do. They measure taxable units, not households. What do I mean? Well, I mean in my household, I'm married and I have a bunch of kids. There's actually on, only one taxable unit. We file one income tax return for all of us, right? But there are a number of households where maybe two people are filing tax returns because they can't claim each other as exemptions, right? One of the people is not a dependent. For example, if you were like 28 years old and living in your parents' house, they can't claim you as a dependent. I don't know if you're aware of that, right? What, I don't, what age does it kick in? Does anyone know? 26. 26? That's why I said 28, to be safe, right? And 26, there's, there's all kinds of things to, to make that work. I think you have to be a full-time student or something like that uh, for that to work. So an adult, an old enough adult living with their parents, that's one example. Uh, there are other examples. It could just be two people, three people are roommates, they're professionals, maybe they work in Washington, D.C., you're in Manhattan, and they're all going to be, in some sense, in the same household, right? Because the fact that they're sharing rent or sharing a mortgage allows them to live where they want to live, and they're paying less every month, all of them. They're paying less every year. But 
they are clearly three identifiable taxable units. So the idea of a taxable unit varies widely, right? The taxable unit in my household, my taxable unit includes seven people. I told you a bunch of kids, right? The taxable unit in Professor Subrick's household is four people. The taxable unit for those of you who file your own tax return may only be one, or it may be two. So there's a lot of variety there. That's interesting, but I'm not sure it matters all that much. That was, but that's a criticism that's been brought up. Another criticism is that it measures static quantiles, not mobility. So it talks about the top 1% share, right? But it doesn't say who's in that top 1%. It actually turns out that who's in that top 1% is something that can change. So it's like the top 1% earns 17% of national income. Okay, but what if the top 1% next year is very different from the top 1% this year. What if people from only the top, I don't know, what if someone in the 85th percentile moves up to the top first percentile, right? There's all kinds of ways that that can flip around and move. And the other thing is it doesn't account for income shifting, for example, due to TRA 86. Something I didn't mention back in, well, I'll talk about it later. Piketty says, I, in, in most ways, I think they have a good response, which is they say there's no permanent, sh well, no, this part of the response is terrible. This is on the income shifting. They say there is no permanent shift in reported capital gains after TRA 86. In other words, they said there's an increase in reported capital gains, but it was only temporary. And it's like, yes, people moved their money, <laughs> right? And then they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they found a way to realize more personal income. And more than that, income shifting is about more than just capital gains. There's a lot of ways to shift your income from one category to another. If now you are taking what you used to be part of, what used to be taxed at the corporate income tax rate, and you're moving it into personal income, uh, there's actually lots of ways to do that. Beyond, you could just make it so that people have higher salaries. <clears throat> and another part of the response was that the overall response to marginal tax rates is inelastic. And what they're referring to there is, uh, I'm tempted to ask if anyone knows what supply side economics is, but let's just say there's a school of thought out there that all tax increases are bad and all tax cuts are good, and not just good for like the people getting the tax cuts and bad for the people seeing the tax increases, but all, they would say all tax cuts are good for the economy, all tax increases are bad for the economy, like at a macro level. That's basic. I'm exaggerating a little bit what supply side economics says, but when you talk to actual supply side ec economists, they seem to view it that way. It's like no matter how low taxes are, they're not low enough in terms of spurring economic growth. Believe it or not, I'm skeptical of that. Uh, that's a little strong, right? What you actually see is that as marginal income tax rates go up, there's not a big change in terms of how much revenue the federal government gets. And particularly when they're cut, they don't see big drops in revenue. So they think that refutes kind of the income shifting story is, well, people's tax rates went down in 1987, right? Their overall tax burden went down in 87, but they didn't seem to respond because revenues didn't change much. Well, that's not the elasticity that matters. What matters is the elasticity for income shifting. It's not how much revenue the federal government gets when taxes change. It's how much do people change their behavior how much do they find ways to shift income around in response to tax changes? The behavioral response is very strong. People, we know, reported a lot more personal uh, income. And that's been estimated uh, by economists uh, like Gordon and Slimrod, who found that there's actually a very high elasticity for income shifting. There's different ways to do income shifting. Uh, you can use corporate debt finance. You can move activity from corporate to non-corporate firms. Uh, there's an increase in entrepreneurial income. And there's changing forms of employee compensation. 
I want to talk about entrepreneurial income. Uh, so Scott Winship is a researcher at the Manhattan Institute right now. He was at the Brookings Institution before. Uh, but Emmanuel uh, Saez has a very, very similar graph. He has a very similar graph to this in that paper with uh, Kopchuk. Only he doesn't call it entrepreneurial income. He doesn't call that red thing entrepreneurial income. He calls it business income. But it's, they must have been using the exact same data source. I think they, they do. Uh, because it's eerily similar. Well, this is a breakdown. This is not the top 1%. This is the top 5%. But it shows what's going on with a person's income in the top half a percent of the income distribution. In other words, we're talking about people who really, really, really earn a lot of income. To be in the top 1%, I think you have to earn, now it's over $300,000 a year. We're talking, this would be maybe a million or more a year in income, if I think about the top half a percent and what that would mean in today's dollars. It's probably near a million dollars a year. Uh, does anyone in here make a million dollars a year? No? Right? It's a lot of money. This is an elite group, right? Well, what makes it up? Well, this thing called rents is very tiny. This thing called interest is not so big. So, right, you know, like the interest you earn on accounts and, and other things. Eh. Right? Dividends? No. Not a big chunk. Wage income, huge. So just the wages, the salaries of people in the top half a percent, that has grown quite significantly from 1980 to today. What else has grown? Entrepreneurial income, or business income, as, as calls it. What does that mean? Well, that's the extra income people are, are earning from, from the businesses that they own. So the big pieces that are growing are salaries, but also very importantly, and it's growing very, you know, it's over this time period, growing very rapidly, is that entrepreneurial income. This is a chart of the top marginal income tax rates. So this means for people who are in the top 1%, and you don't have to be in the top 1%, you just have to meet some threshold of income. As a matter of fact, I'm currently, somehow or another, I ended up in the top income tax bracket. All right? I bet a lot of your parents are in the top income tax bracket. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means the first twenty or $30,000 they don't really pay much tax on. In terms of federal income tax, it might be zero, right? And then the next bracket they pay a certain percentage on, and then the next bracket they pay a certain percentage on. So it's not your overall tax rate, but it's what you pay on the last dollar earned. All right? And if you look in the 1950s, it was 91%. Right? In 1944 and 45, it was 94 percent, according to this chart. So that top marginal tax rate in the U.S. has bounced around a lot. Think of this as basically the tax on people who make a whole lot of money, right? And it's the tax on them making more, is the best way to think about a marginal tax rate. It's the tax rate they would pay if they made more. So imagine. You are being taxed at 91%, a 91% marginal rate. And your boss comes to you and says, I have great news for you. I'm giving you a 5% raise this year. What's your reaction to that? Thanks, but could you buy me a company car instead? Right? Could you send me on a few extra trips instead? Could you find some way to compensate me that won't be taxed at 91%? That's the logic here, right? And now we sort of understand how income shifting can happen, which is there are lots of ways to be compensated that may or may not be taxed at that top marginal rate. Now, an interesting thing is starting around late 70s, early 80s, the IRS started to really get touchy and crack down on this. So they started really focusing on sources of income that weren't just your salary or your, what was in your paycheck. So if you had a company car but you were using it for personal use, eh, 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 all that personal use counts as part of your income for tax purposes and it's taxable. Uh, 
And there have been uh, some major elected officials who've gotten in trouble with this because they were using, for example, like a Senate, like senators, using a Senate car service for all their personal stuff, right? To take them to their beach house on the weekend. No, 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 that counts as income. Not, you can't do that, but you have to report it to the IRS as part of your income, and you have to pay taxes on it. So it's a very, it's just this interesting, this huge changes in tax policy over this time period. But what's fascinating to me is you had all these changes in the income tax and the top marginal rate, and other brackets have moved too, but you had all these changes in the top income tax rate. But guess where federal revenues have been as a percent of GDP? They've been pretty flat right around 20% of GDP over this entire time period. They were high during World War II, right? I'm sorry, this goes back to 1913, so no, right? But starting, <laughs> starting around the 50s, right? Starting around the 50s, it's amazing how flat and steady revenues as a share of GDP have been. Despite all of these fairly big changes in tax policy. So I go back to this Piketty and Says data, which is derived from U.S. income taxes, right? And it's the top 1%, so it's people who earn a lot. This is the top marginal rate, which is the tax on the extra income earned by people who earn a lot. I'm going to do this. Does anyone see anything? Upside down version of the other. What are Piketty and Says measuring? I don't think they're measuring income inequality. I think they're measuring how sensitive really, 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 really high earners, people with really high salaries are, to changes in the tax code. <coughs> Professor Subrick thinks it's lawyers, and he's on to something there, but but if I'm looking just at the Piketty and Saez data series, they drew this data from tax returns. And here's the data on top marginal rates. And it's, it's a little striking. So let me get at some, some, uh, some explanation here. Is inequality overstated? What can that data tell us? This is the most famous income inequality data out there right now. I mean, I guess in some sense, Gini coefficients are still more famous. But most of the debate over the last 10 years has been on the top 1% and how much they have. And it's been on the top 1% and how much they have, largely because Piketty and Saez went out and gathered all the data and tried to figure that out with this income tax data. So people like Alan Reynolds and Scott Winship uh, they would say yes, they would say inequality is overstated. Uh, I don't go that quite that far. I would say the growth in inequality is overstated. But I would also say the decline in inequality in the 40s to into the 50s is also overstated. I would say that compared to that big U shape you see in the graph, I would say overall it's probably been a lot flatter than that. Maybe there's still a bit of a U shape, but I would say it's probably just been a much flatter trend than what you see in that chart of the top 1%. The data are very messy when it comes to measuring changes in income inequality over time, but what they're really good at telling us is how that top 1% or how the top half a percent or tenth of percent or whatever, how sensitive they are to changes in the tax code. That when there's a big change in the tax code, there seems to be a big reaction in terms of how much income they report on their tax forms. Mobility. So of all these things, this is the one that personally I care about the most, and I think this is the one that most of us should care about the most. I can make a case for why, the basic case for why, is what this means is this is your ability to succeed, right? That if you are able to meet a demand in the market, if you are able to acquire skills that are valuable to other people, if you're able to produce something that other people value, can you move up? Can you do better? Can you earn more that way? That's what income mobility is about. Notice I did not pull this from like the most right-wing source I could find. <laughs>
MSNBC put it up, but it's actually based on um, it's based on the mobility data that came from uh, Raj Chetty at Harvard and Emmanuel says at Berkeley and all these and all these people who stu study income distribution, uh, there was a major effort to really gather and look at the data on income mobility because people said, hey, mobility matters. So the number of people who stay in the top 1% for 10 consecutive years is 0.6%. So I guess you could frame that as most people in the top 1% stay in the top 1% for 10 years or more. I have another way to think about it, right? which is the second line there, the second bar on this graph. 12% of people manage to get into the top 1% for one year or more. <coughs> so 12% of people at some point in their lives are going to be in the top 1%. <coughs> they're going to have at least one good year where they're in that top 1%. That's, that's interesting. That suggests that at the top, maybe in the top 10, 15%, there's actually quite a bit of mobility going on and that people bounce in and out of really high percentiles. If you just take the top 5%, 39% of adults over their working lives, 39% find themselves in the top 5% at some point. 56% find themselves in the top 10%. And if you just look at the top quintile, the top 20%, 73% of people at some point are actually in the top 20% of the income distribution. I think, I really think how you look at this is a matter of like psychology and temperament and other things I can't address as an economist. Because many people look at this sa these same data and they say, see how low mobility is and I look at it and I say, Seems like a lot of action going on. Seems like a lot of people are able to move up and earn a high income, at least at some point in their lives. This is intergenerational mobility. So what this means is, this is saying if you look at parents who were born, or parents, if you look at parents who have income in one quintile, all right, so you have the bottom 20%, the next 20%, the next 20%, the next 20%, and the top 20%. If you look at parents and what in income quintile they're born into, where do their children end up? So for example, 43% of children who are born into the bottom quintile remain there as adults. Let me say the exact same thing, but just reframing it. 57% of children born into the bottom quintile move up into another quintile. So is that high mobility or low mobility? I don't know. Right? That's a normative question. I'm not sure I can adequately address that and persuade people. But to me, 57% of people who are born into the bottom quintile, the lowest earning 20%, find themselves when they grow up and they move away and they get a career that they're in a higher income bracket. Go over all the way over to the other side. 40% of children born in the top quintile remain there as adults. And by the way, think about what income mobility means. It means some people are moving up. What else does it mean? Some people are moving down. 40% of children born in the top quintile remain there as adults. I, I guess that's the measure of privilege right there, right? Just purely in income terms, right? 40%, that's a lot. But what does that mean? It means that 60% of children born in the top quintile move down at least one. And then you can look at this chart and you can actually see. <coughs> of children born in the top quintile, 23% move down one. 19% though move down two. And 10% of children born in the top quintile move down three quintiles. What about over here? 17%, am I adding this right? This says 17% of children born in the bottom quintile end up in the middle quintile. 
4% end up in the top. It's obviously going to be rare that someone move from the bottom all the way to the top or from the top all the way to the bottom. But still it's a significant number of people who do that. But more importantly is in any case at the bottom and at the top the majority end up somewhere else from where they started. So again, is that high mobility? Is that low mobility? I look at it and I see relatively high mobility. I see a surprising amount of mobility given my experience with people who earn a lot of money and their kids and all of that, right? In some sense, it surprises me less on the bottom end because I see a lot of people who come in, particularly people who are children of immigrants or whatever, and it, I, it's not unusual for me to see people who are doing a lot better than their parents did. So the question then is, is inequality a problem itself or is it a symptom of some other ill, some other problem? Larry Summers and lots of other people have all kinds of issues with Piketty's book. And Alan Reynolds and people like that have real issues with Piketty and says his research. My, and you know, I, I'm interested in the data and I share some of those concerns. I don't share other concerns. But my main concern is when you read Piketty or when you read Emmanuel Says or you read Gabriel Zuckman, these very famous high caliber economists, when you read them, they seem to be treating inequality itself as the problem that needs to be treated. Right? Is inequality itself the problem, or is it concerning because it's the, a symptom of some other issue, right? Is it just bad, and, and you, this is some, again a normative question you have to ask yourselves, is it bad that the top 1% earns 17.5% of total income? Is that in and of itself bad? Or is it bad because that's really a symptom of how hard it is for people to break into that top 1%. How hard it is for some people to do better, actually for a large number of people, to do not just better, but maybe to do a lot better. We saw that in the mobility day, there are lots of people who were able to do better. But why isn't there even more? Why don't you see people who are able to do a lot better? So I think this is a really important question. I see three basic options, right? Well, I see two policy options and then I have a comment. I love how I've made it three things, but really there's two options, right? First policy option, two basic ways to approach this. One is reduce measured inequality itself. This is easy. We know how to do this. Raise top marginal rates. You'll reduce income inequality. I have a great idea for how to reduce wealth inequality. Massively increase the taxes on wealth people will find ways to hold less of it, or hold less of it visibly, right? Because that's where these data come from. They come from what people report to the government. You can reduce measured inequality by taxing the heck out of the thing that you're measuring. That works, right? If there were 110% tax on bottled water, I would not be holding it bottled water right now. Right? Professor Subrick would have said, no, screw you in your demands for water. I'll get you a latte. We know how to solve measured inequality, right? The other policy approach would be to try and solve the underlying causes of inequality. But that's really, really hard, all right? It's really, really hard. So there's an economist named Raj Chetty who's done a lot of work on income inequality and mobility, and he's actually co-authored with Says on some of the mobility stuff. And what Raj Chetty, he's an economist at Harvard, he's done a lot of research on neighborhood, neighborhoods and the environment in the U.S. that children grow up in and how that affects their future earnings. <laughs> And so he finds all kinds of interesting stuff based on families moving. 
the basic gist of his research is, in this area, is when children move to better neighborhoods, they end up earning more over their lifetime than children in those same neighborhoods, in those same conditions, who didn't move to better neighborhoods. Now, how does he define good versus bad neighborhood? Well, it's crime and how the schools are rated and the percentage, the percentage that go to college. And he also looks at things like average income and all of that stuff. So, interesting. And to be honest, I haven't dug deep enough into his data to know if this isn't totally solid or if there's maybe a bit of an endogeneity problem. Because one thing I would say is, right, but the kind of parents who would move you just to put you, move just to put you in a better school district, right? Or would move just to get you away from the crime or whatever, or who have that capability, maybe there's something different about those parents, right? And if there's something different about the parents, then maybe there's something different about the child to begin with. Whatever. I generally accept it. I generally accept the idea, and there's an economist named James Heckman in Chicago who talks about this a lot, which is if you, are, if you live in a dangerous place, right? If you live in a dangerous place, an unsafe place, and you go to a school that's dangerous and where the quality is low, and you are surrounded by people who don't earn very much and don't have ambitions to earn very much, and if in general your life is very unstable and chaotic, right? Maybe you move a lot, so there are sociologists who look at this, if you move a lot but don't <laughs> move up, right? That that creates instability and that affects children and how, much, and how well they learn and in turn how well they do in life, right? That, that affects your prospects and that affects your mobility, no doubt. But the implication of Chetty's research is to solve the problem of inequality, you, what you need, you don't need much. You just need to somehow fix education in America. You need to fix crime in America. You need to, uh, you need to uh, make it so that uh, people view education positively. So you need to change people's minds about how they view ed education and students' attitudes, right? And you need to make parents care more and be more active in their kids' lives. That's all you need to do. It's simple and easy, but that's what you're left with, right? And so uh, the, some of this Chetty research on, uh, well, with Saez on mobility, right? An interesting point is despite the changes in measured inequality over the past 20 years, what they found when they studied mobility is that mobility itself hasn't actually changed much. So those charts on mobility I showed you, I, I pulled those like, that was like from a year ago, right? Less than a year ago. That was from a few months ago, right? A few months ago, that was the most up-to-date data. But guess what? Those shifts from generation to generation, for example, in the second chart I showed you on mobility, that hasn't changed a lot in 20 years. It hasn't gotten worse, and it hasn't really gotten better. It's been fairly stable. Interesting finding. I guess, it's a, I guess that's because those underlying things probably haven't changed much, right? Education hasn't gotten a whole lot better, but it probably hasn't gotten a whole lot worse, right? Parents haven't gotten a whole lot better at being parents, but they probably haven't gotten a whole lot worse, right? One thing I would say, though, is that violent crime has definitely fallen during that time period, and yet we haven't seen an improvement in the mobility data because of that. But violent crime has dropped dramatically. Has it dropped, though, in low-income areas and low-income neighborhoods? Maybe not so much. So that's worth considering. Maybe most of the crime drop has been middle to high-income levels. It's worth considering. 